Hello, uh, it's a pleasure to be here for another episode of uh, citiesabc.com interviews and profiles with leading thought leaders and global experts and leaders that are transforming the world we live, especially in a time when things are upside down and we have a digital disruption going from econo economics to healthcare and a lot of other things. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome to the citiesabc.com uh, series of interviews and podcasts with a person I deeply admire and I know for a couple of years, Michael Turpin. So Michael Turpin, well, that's, we could speak probably 10 minutes or 20 just as introduction, but I'll try to summarize and let him speak as well. Uh, so Michael is one of the leading global uh, blockchain experts as well as technologist who was um, in the past the creator of market wire and social radios, but as well now leading worldwide the transform group that includes the leading um, Bitcoin and crypto uh, event coin agenda and the Bit Angels, and as well one of the recognized leaders in the industry that has, I think, three angles that are quite unique a thought leader, an industry policymaker, and as well uh, uh, an active agent that has been both an ambassador but pushing the positive um, of the industry. And as well, of course, if you look at some of the highlights, he was the first. Uh, PR, besides, of course, creating market wire, which is in itself a massive achievement, but as well creating, um, being the first PR responsible for Ethereum and a lot of other, uh, we could go special on the crypto industry, all the achievements of Michael are completely unique. So Michael, welcome to our series of interviews. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. So Michael, I would like to start, and I think for the ones that don't know your history, I always like to go for the history of people. Could you give us a bit of your history from your background, education, until your career? Sure, sure. So I, uh, I grew up in upstate New York, um, just uh, in Buffalo, New York, uh, near Niagara Falls, for international folks, because I know that town better. And um, just always knew from a young age uh, that I wanted to, uh, to be a writer. And, um, you know, that sort of led me to go to um, the Newhouse School of, uh, of, a, of Journalism, Public Communications at Syracuse University for my bachelor's. And, uh, um, you know, really just kind of was trying to figure out, you know, whether they, were, they didn't have jobs for the great American novelist. And I wanted to be a magazine writer and those were hard jobs to get. So I started out in daily newspaper reporting and then that led me um, into the PR world where I had a couple of uh, jobs early in my career, um, working as a PR director at two universities um, and also on a couple of Olympic Games. And uh, then I started my own uh, firm um, in uh, 1990. Uh, it's been 30 years now that I've been in this space. And, um, and then just uh, I always just followed whatever I thought was something that interested me personally and that I thought would be growing faster than the economy overall. In the 90s, that was video games um, and consumer electronics. And um, I always figured if I learned about technologies before the reporters did, they would always take my call because I could you know, clue them into what's, what's hot before they know about it or explain what it does. And um, the internet was sort of the first big you know, break um, in 1992, I started dabbling with it, and um, in 93, I started uh, what was the seed of what became uh, uh, Internet Wire, um, which became Market Wire uh, as a spinoff from my PR firm. It was the first internet based press release distribution company, which was funded by Sequoia. But before we spun that off, um, the Turpin Group was my first PR firm, and we represented, you know, both big companies like uh, TIAC and Shinon, and uh, we were the agency record for Konami in the, in the video game world for, for many years. And, um, and then also just did an awful lot of the, the dot-coms of the era. Um, that was sort of the, uh, the ICO of uh, you know, 20 uh, years ago. And, uh, you know, sold that firm in... Uh, uh, 2000, uh, just as I pivoted to take uh, money in from uh, Sequoia to expand the market wire. And um, market wire then uh, was sold in 2006. Um, it's uh, 
we, we partnered with NASDAQ to come up with the name MarketWire to expand it beyond uh, just the internet because we weren't just for internet companies. We were using internet versus satellite as a protocol. And uh, that was brand new back in the early 90s. And we quickly took a lot of market share. And um, it then, uh, the NASDAQ uh, merged it uh, later on with um, uh, a satellite network uh, that was called Prime Zone. Uh, it's now um, called, uh, the combined entity is uh, called Globe Newswire. And NASDAQ sold it about a year and a half ago to um, Apollo. Uh, um, you know, nine billion dollar um, uh, company in the New York Stock Exchange. Um, I sold my uh, first PR firm um, to a roll up that then ended up with um, uh, FT Consulting, which is also New York Stock Exchange, multi billion dollar company. So uh, perhaps I have one more uh, exit left uh, in my career to a multi billion dollar company, and then uh, I can just go and play with. Uh, um, what I really love to do, which is uh, helping uh, entrepreneurs with uh, with startups and watching them go from uh, nothing to something. Uh, you know, meeting Vitalik for the first time, and you know when he first had the you know pre white paper, and other folks uh, seeing him go from uh, you know I think the blockchain is one of the fastest growing spaces where you can see something going from an idea to uh, a really accepted protocol and, and and the speed with which that happened from 2013 when I first got in um, through I'd say about early 2018 when the frenzy kind of peaked and uh, regulators around the world decided they wanted to slow it down with uh, uh, not so much regulation but vague uh, regulation and enforcement actions and uh, that's sort of where we're sitting now and uh, I think uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic is going to um, make uh, uh, you know some proposals to let people invest money um, willingly into startups a little bit easier than it's been before. Um, but we'll get to that later. So um, I started Transform after I uh, get Social Radius was one of the early social media companies that I started after uh, selling MarketWire. And um, that kind of rolled into doing big company social media for places like Philips and, um, you know, Marriott were some of our clients and uh, uh, Bombay Sapphire. And then, um, you know, starting with uh, the early startup companies in, in the Bitcoin space in early 2013, uh, including the first uh, ICO. And that's really where I started uh, uh, in early 2013 as well, um, started Bit Angels with uh, David Johnston, who I met at the uh, the first uh, Bitcoin Foundation conference, and we've done a number of things over the years together. And and uh, we can talk about where Bit Angels has gone from uh, kind of a ragtag uh, uh, DIY effort around a lunch table at the Bitcoin Foundation to where we've been up to about 15 cities um, before the uh, the lockdowns, and now we're doing a uh, Virtual Bit Angels. We have one on uh, this Friday. You can go to bitangels.network and uh, um, find out about that. And uh, today we actually, in about an hour, have uh, <laughs> this one that won't air until then, but uh, this is uh, mid April I'm talking. But uh, just go to the sites and see what, what's up next. Um, Coinagenda.com for, um, uh, for uh, Coinagenda, I really envisioned as being the the Goldman Sachs conference of crypto uh, because so many conferences were multi-purpose. They were, they'd have a track on investing. They'd have a track on, uh, on, on uh, consensus mechanisms. They would have a track on uh, libertarian philosophies and people would come to see my track on investing and they'd say, well, you know, I, I love what, what your panel said or what your keynote said, but I had no idea what everybody else was talking about. And so I thought to get, the traditional investing community involved in Bitcoin and blockchain. We needed to have both a network with Bet Angels and then a, a what started as an annual conference. We got up to five times a year um, in 2018 uh, when we had Europe, Asia, a summit, uh, our global conference uh, in Las Vegas, and then our Caribbean conference in Puerto Rico, which we just had in February before everything locked down. And we're still hoping to have our seventh annual global conference in uh, October in Las Vegas, 
cool to see how much the city has opened up and whether we'll be able to do it at uh, a casino or whether we're going to do it, um, you know, at a university. We did we did half of it at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas last year. It might be easier um, just with social distancing and all that. So that's a fantastic uh, career to say less from multi-billion dollars companies to radical uh, new innovation and as well disruption on, on the Bitcoin, crypto and blockchain. So one question before we go to all these different details. So from the experience in the internet industry and, and pre-internet industry to the internet industry and then to the blockchain industry, there was a massive shift in technology and investment and even in the way you look from a corporate perspective because of course like you said there's a libertarian part in the crypto industry and the blockchain industry but as as well uh, an industry enterprise side so how do you see the shift from the internet years to the blockchain years and and right now of course with COVID-19 we are in another angle as well so especially the, the two angles how do you see that shift because you are part of both well, as they say, um, history doesn't uh, repeat, but it, it tends to rhyme. And, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of uh, corollaries between what happened in the growth of the Internet. At first, it was really laughed at. I remember in 94, it was when, it was when I launched um, Internet Wire um, at a conference where we were the only Internet company in an interactive conference, because back then interactive meant multimedia, CD-ROMs. And literally, I had people coming up to me and asking whether they had to make a deal with Mark Andreessen to, to get on the internet or to put up a website. I mean, that, that was, uh, and, and I had, this is a lot, I was based in Los Angeles at that point, and I had, um, you know, major studios and networks telling me that they would never go on the internet because it's just too difficult. Uh, their mom is not going to get a second uh, phone line and put up with beep, 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 beep in the middle of the night and um, you know it's all about the GUI. I mean the internet in 1994-95 um, for the average person was a horrific experience and you didn't have audio yet, you didn't have video. Once you got video it was you know really grainy and slow and uh, you know now you can watch Netflix on your uh, iPhone. So the speed and the, and the graphic user interface is what made all the difference for adoption. And I believe we're going to see another wave of that. We've been growing at the same pace as social media did and as the early uh, web did um, in blockchain. Um, but we're, you know, we're still stuck in kind of the 94, 95 uh, uh, era. And there's usually a very uh, rapid pace of adoption between the uh, early adopters who have a different set of needs than the um, than the, uh, the the early mainstream, and I think that there's a few things that need to happen. Um, I've got a, a thought leadership piece in uh, in CoinDesk uh, today on the, the homepage uh, called uh, "Is Crypto Having Its Zoom Moment?" And uh, we actually worked uh, as a client with Zoom in the early days when they had a thirty million dollar valuation versus how many tens of billions they are right now. And, um, you know, they took off before this crisis, but now they've really become mainstream. And uh, my thought was, you know, who's going to step up in the crypto industry to take um, one of the applications of uh, crypto um, mainstream uh, when, we're, when we're distanced? I mean, obviously, the, the biggest one, I mean, right now people use uh, crypto for store value and for speculation. And that's Bitcoin. Um, Ethereum is still, it's still very early. I mean, it took a year to even develop the basic platform, but you now have uh, your first wave of DeFi on it. And that's uh, been causing the value of Ethereum to go up uh, as more people start looking for ways to get, you know, significantly more than 0.1% interest on their money. Um, and they can do that through DeFi. And there's just a, a whole wide array of applications that I'm very excited about, um, you know, going through hyper growth in the next few years. And uh, I do believe that the, uh, the token sale market is going to come back as well. Um, if you told anybody in 2001, after 9-11, that there would ever be another dot-com finance, they would laugh at you. Um, and yet, 
two years later, Google went public. They just didn't call themselves Google.com, but they were a consumer internet company. And then Facebook. And if you look today, who are the largest, most profitable companies on earth uh, that are actually growing uh, despite the rest of the market getting hammered? Um, Amazon, uh, Netflix. I mean, these were all consumer internet companies that uh, did not exist in 1994. And, um, you know, uh, that's the promise of, uh, of the blockchain 20 years from now. And uh, it won't happen overnight, but it will happen. Uh, it will go from its current uh, adoption of, what, maybe 1% of the, of the world market, if that, 50 million, you know, maybe we're at 1%, less, less than 1% to 10%. And then once you get to 10%, it moves very quickly because you have the tools, you've got the sort of safety. I think what really is going to be required to get there, aside from just um, easier interface, is going to be easier onboarding. I mean, right now, you know, people will say, I want to buy some Bitcoin. How do I do it? And I have to point them to an exchange where they have to go through just, you know, days of KYC to buy $50. And so... You know, there's 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 new things out there like um, uh, you know, fold steel with Visa, where you get uh, you know your your credit card bills rounded up and you get to keep it in Bitcoin. Or um, uh, there's a, there's, a, there's a, a gift card now that you can uh, um, you know get, get uh, it's almost like a savings bond in Bitcoin. So there's there's a, there's a lot of innovation that that's that's happening now, and I think that once you have uh, more uh, clarity and ease of, of onboarding. Um, and I think one of the things that's going to require that, that is to have a major telephone company that already has all your KYC, they know where you live, um, they've got your driver's license, buy or partner with a major uh, exchange. And then all of a sudden you've got 100 million people who are using that telco, uh, whether it's Verizon or T-Mobile or whoever, um, and they run a promotion and say, switch to T-Mobile and get, uh, you know, a hundred dollars uh, worth of free tokens, including the hit new game, Angry Birds blockchain. And that's coming. And, and gaming is usually the first, uh, killer app of mainstream adoption. Uh, remember Pokemon Go? I mean, we never went too much further than that in the AR space, but there was a little period of time people were running around, uh, um, you know, trying to find their Pokemon Go characters. And uh, I think you're going to find that Uncle Milty moment, as I like to call it, in blockchain within the next two, three years. That's, uh, um, yeah, I think a fantastic analogy from these three. It doesn't repeat it's Ryman as well, what is happening. So uh, two questions on the blockchain side. Um, so the first one is, you are in the inception of Bitcoin and the inception of crypto. And there's the part of trading and investment, the ICO industry, all the tokens. And that somehow didn't collapse, like you said. Well, it was early in Bitcoin. I wasn't there at the inception. I was at the inception of the ICO. No, I understand. Um, the, angel, the angels did the very first ICO. <laughs> yeah, but, but if you look at Bitcoin, it's 2011. You were 2013. It's two years. So, And of course, initially, the first two years were very dark. There was almost not a lot of people involved. Let's put it that way. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting because obviously those were really critical years. If you got in in, in 2013, you were able to buy, you know, Bitcoin for eleven dollars at the start of the year, and um, you know, even by July, it was still you could buy sixty five dollar Bitcoin. I remember speaking to an, uh, <clears throat> the New York Angels about the promise of Bitcoin in July of uh, 2013, and I just got blank stares, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, uh, the only thing Bitcoin can be used for is uh, drugs and prostitutes, and you better run away as fast as possible. And that was speaking to 100 you know, investors who had just listened to a pitch for a social bicycle app, you know, and they invested in it. Yeah, but that is a very good point, and that's, my question comes out of that. So, so from the Bitcoin origins in 2011 to 2014, where the ICOs start initially, actually the ICOs, to be honest, was more 2015, 16, that starts really coming at least in a bigger scale. So you went through all this inception and all these different parts. And so on the crypto side, um, we are right now in 2020, so it passed seven years. And to be honest, if you look at, can we say that partly crypto industry 
at a meltdown, but not the blockchain. How do you see that part? I would like to ask someone like you your opinion on that, because that's a very... Well, the market, just like the stock market is doing now, um, uh, has had several cycles. Um, the typical cycle since uh, the Fed was created uh, 100 years ago, um, 106 years ago, um, was, um, you know, it has been seven to 10 year bull markets, um, where pretty much you just buy the S and P and you're going to do better than bank interest, uh, other than the few years where CDs were really high in the eighties and early nineties. Uh, and, um, and, and that including the period where it was really flat during the forties uh, and fifties and early sixties. But for the most part, you have these seven to 10 year bull markets. Um, and particularly the last few ones with all the money printing. And, and, and since, uh, um, they said they started letting, uh, companies buy their own uh, stock. Um, you know, the stock market has been a great place to be as long as you've got in at the bottom <laughs> and then sold out before the, uh, before the top and the top usually happened, um, when there was, um, a crisis that, uh, you couldn't, uh, kind of print your way out of, um, quickly. And, um, you know, 9-11, now, now the, um, the, the pandemic, um, and of course the great housing, uh, bubble. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, we were already overheated in terms of, uh, what uh, the PE was. And if you back out the, the stock buybacks, the PEs were astronomical. So really there's been not much growth. There's a lot of, you know, charts. You can look this up if you just Google the keywords. Um, or, or just watch Max Kaiser any day of the, uh, any of the three days of the week he's on, um, or read Zero Hedge, or I mean, there's just a lot of, uh, you know, uh, hard data on how overheated the, um, uh, the stock market has been. Uh, Harry Dent is a good friend of mine. He's an economist, he's written a number of books, and uh, he basically said that, you know, the economy at uh, 2008 should have kept going down or been flat, but instead the, the money printing just kept it soaring to way above where it should be. I mean, we shouldn't be talking as should it be 30,000 or 24,000 without the money printing, without the, uh, the stock buybacks, you know, you'd be still you know, scratching around 10. Um, but uh, that's that, you know, ability of the U.S. to, uh, you know, there's a meme going around now, um, you know, um, brrr, it was the money printer. And, um, you know, we've shown that uh, any of the past arguments about, uh, responsibility for budget deficits and our grandchildren will be paying for this. No one's going to be paying for this. Um, you know, we're in an interest rate of 0.1 right now. And I, I saw a presentation the other day that said that the interest we're paying right now on this gigantic national debt is actually less than we were paying in the eighties when interest rates were 15%. So, um, it's comparable to the size of the economy. So, uh, you know, this is all, um, you know, part of the game plan of uh, fiat money. And um, it keeps going until, like, like the stock market, until, until a, um, you know, a, a, a black swan, um, you know, disrupts everything. And, um, you know, we had the pandemic for the stock market. And the initial reaction, of course, of crypto was to flee to the U.S. dollar like everybody else. Um, but you know, the U.S. dollar is, you know, all indications are that it's, it's in the descent and the RMB and perhaps um, Bitcoin and gold are on the ascent. And um, we just don't know exactly when, but, um, you know, uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, even if we have some uh, disruptions that are caused by stock market um, meltdowns and people fleeing for cash, they're going to, they're going to still be offset by the new people coming into Bitcoin, which they are right now. Um, and as more people get into Bitcoin, then they learn about Ethereum, then they learn about what you can do with programmable, um, uh, blockchains. And, you know, like I said, we're still kind of in the equivalent era of the, uh, internet before Netscape went public. There's no public, uh, blockchain companies. When, when you know Coinbase goes public, when uh, Bitmain goes public, and um, you know 
uh, you can sort of see um, Binance, perhaps you can sort of see what types of uh, uh, profit margins are involved with successful companies as they go into a bull market. Um, you know, then all of a sudden, I think you're going to have um, another bull market for uh, not just the stocks, but for the assets themselves. Um, first and foremost, Bitcoin. And, you know, when Bitcoin gets a cold, the rest of crypto gets pneumonia. When Bitcoin uh, moons, uh, you know, it certainly helps a lot of other aspects of, uh, of, the, uh, of the infrastructure because people who were early in and who believe in building on top of it, um, you know, now have a lot more wealth. Um, if you figure that 10 million of the 21 million Bitcoins that ever exist were earned initially by mining, um, you know, in the first four years when the average price was under a dollar, uh, there's a handful of people who you may not even know who've got 10, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 Bitcoin, um, which when Bitcoin inevitably hits 50,000, I think probably this cycle, or 100, 200,000 in five to nine years, you know, do the math on 100,000 times 100,000 and uh, you get a pretty large number. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, a lot of things there. So a couple of um, just uh, some details on that. So you created the Beat Angels in May 2013 and Coin Agenda in 2014 in January. So from that inception, so there's almost three varieties, three divisions in terms of what you see as the crypto evolution. There's the first one that was Bitcoin, the second with the ICO explosion and everything that came out of that and now we are going through another one which is kind of the digital currencies which we cannot say that is crypto but somehow it came out of this with facebook being or the facebook uh, uh, digital currency being probably the exponential and as well the chinese government new digital currency that is as well powered by blockchain so how do you see these three um, iterations and as well the impact that we have in the world because of course with the crypto still going and Binance and all the, the, the ones you mentioned, Coin Agenda, Coin Coin Desk and all these big players that are the biggest ones. But then you have of course the I'm talking from a crypto analogy, then I go to blockchain. Then you have definitely mm -hmm. the the Ethereum's, the mainstream tokens, which are still the biggest in the world, uh, from Cardano to to Ethereum and so forth and, and uh and then, of course, right now we have the iterations that are mainstream global players. That is, of course, the, the Libra of Facebook is not working as they would like to, but it's still a major achievement for something that comes out of crypto inception. And, of course, Chinese government officially moving forward with this. How do you see these three uh, iterations of the crypto universe? Well, just like the Internet uh, spun off to a lot of different Internet applications. I mean, what... Uh, Salesforce.com does is very different than what uh, Amazon does and very different than what uh, Facebook or Google do. These are stacks that are built on the, the, the internet. And, um, you know, I've said for years that we're going to build stacks on top of basic blockchain systems. And there's not just one basic blockchain. There's not just one stack. You've got the Bitcoin stack. And they're trying to build lightning on top of that and other things. Um, I personally think that the Bitcoin will remain as a store of value, but that other, um, other players will be able to innovate um, for um, payments. And payments is all about being fast, reliable, and inexpensive. And, you know, I think that Bitcoin just has a legacy uh, problem there. So I think that it is absolutely going to be the store of value um, because, you know, it's never been hacked. It's, uh, it's, it's already got a lot of people treating it like digital gold. And I think that will be more so. And, um, you know, so that's, uh, you know, it's been said that the goal is to get to 10% of the value of gold, um, which at the time, I think I heard that first said the value of gold was about maybe 6 trillion, uh, globally. And now it's probably closer to 10 trillion. And, uh, you know, a trillion of, uh, of Bitcoin is about eight or nine times where we are today. But I think that in this environment of excessive money printing, the price of gold is probably going to double. And so that means that you might have a 200 trillion or 300 trillion dollars worth of Bitcoin. And there's only 20 million Bitcoin. The price is going up uh, means the price of each unit has to go up. And so that's store value. Payments, um, 
you know, are all about speed and about uh, universal acceptability. And then you've got sovereign coins, which are about governments uh, adopting them um, primarily as sort of just a digital version of their central banks. They get to, it's like tether, they get to mint and burn, except I don't think central banks ever burn. And um, so the digital RMB is gonna, uh, I think, be an explosive development. I think it's going to um, have impact far outside of China. I think that um, people will use it instead of had Libra been able to develop at its uh, uh, you know, original uh, game plan uh, that people um, all over the world, particularly in the third world, are gonna start using digital RMB inside of WhatsApp, inside of uh, Alipay, inside of Alibaba. Um, the way that they use uh, cell phone minutes in Kenya um, and it gives them something other than their uh, local currency. I mean, if I'm in Argentina and I'm or in Venezuela and, um, you know, holding on to, you know, USD, a thousand dollar equivalent of my currency means it's worth $500 a couple months later. Um, I want dollars. And if I can't get dollars because uh, the U.S. is uh, very limiting in, in how I can get those, um, or your country is very limiting in, say, buying, you know, I mean, Tether and USD uh, equivalents, other stable coins, um, I, I think are going to be very sought after in the third world as stores of value. Um, for those who, say, think that Bitcoin is, uh, you know, fluctuates too much, well, the U.S. dollar um, it's pretty consistent that it goes down in value 4% every year. But if it's the benchmark, then, and yours is going down 40%, then, you know, you're okay. But I think that as China gets the digital RMB into more and more hands of consumers, they're going to start thinking about, um, you know, buying things in RMB. So, and um, when it comes to the blockchain enterprise, so we have in one end the crypto part and I want to touch the blockchain enterprise, the, the use of blockchain, like you mentioned, like the internet, it took 20 years to become mainstream and then all the different iterations. How do you see the blockchain and actually the comparison between blockchain and internet? Because this is a very important thing even to demystify blockchain. And how do you see the, the major uh, um, applications of the technology in itself? Hmm. So, I mean, there are, there are, there's a battle still for platforms, right? So I, I mentioned two of the applications, store of value and um, payments, but um, programmability and having the next layer of software, the, uh, the, the blockchain that, that apps are built on, um, that's still up for grabs. I'd say Ethereum is certainly the, the one that's um, most, uh, um, you know, ahead right now, but they also have issues with, uh, with speed and uh, with getting clogged. And, you know, they keep talking about Ethereum 2.0 being two years down the road. And it seems like it's whatever today is plus two years, whatever anybody asks. So what you've had is you've had um, uh, forks of Ethereum, like Ethereum Classic. Um, you've had um, people going in uh, just taking some of the open source code and creating their own uh, EDM uh, products. Um, I'm a, uh, a, a co-founder of a company called Aspire. It's aspire.tech and it's not launched yet. Um, it's sort of, been, it's, it's launched and it's sort of um, um, beta test, test mode, but it is up and running. And it basically takes, um, it's a re-envisioning of Counterparty um, which was built so that you could actually run the Ethereum virtual machine on top of it. And um, we're working on that right now. And when that's out, we'll be able to do everything that, um, that Ethereum does in ERC-20, 721, you name it, um, but for a fraction of the fees and a much higher speed. So that's going to be uh, launching later this year. Uh, Jim Blasco has worked with me on a number of uh, um, projects to sort of the um, – technology uh, partner of uh, Transform for oh, wait, about six years. Um, he came up with that idea and uh, we funded it through uh, my incubator, e-commerce labs, and uh, uh, now it's rolled out as a standalone uh, Nevada company. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just equity based right now, but as uh, token sales come back and uh, I'm, I'm really hopeful 
I mean, right now, when token sales come back, I'll have to block the U.S., even though it's a U.S. company, just because of the way the, the, the vagueness of the laws are, even though it's clearly not a security, since they just have a theory of the security. Um, but um, I'm hopeful that, uh, you know, the, the Hester Peirce uh, um, proposal for having a three-year safe harbor for when you launch to see so you have three years to, sh to build a community to show that you're sufficiently decentralized or useful and not having any other hallmark of a security um, will bring back the uh, token sale market um, in a big way, just like the token sale market was dead, by the way, in, uh, in 20, uh, early 2015. Uh, you had um, Ethereum, which raised $18 million. Nobody else came close to that. Um, and the few that you had coming out early in the year were you know, raising 100,000 here, 100,000 there, price of Bitcoin had crashed. Um, you know, just like uh, I said, the stock market is in its seven to 10 year bull, slow bull markets, and then a sudden crash, and then the Fed jumps in and, you know, pours money in it and rescues the rich and the poor get crushed. Um, it's the opposite in, uh, in, in Bitcoin. It's a four year cycle, which we're just entering the halving, and it's a typically a four-year bear market <laughs> with little, you know, little bear, little bull traps uh, along the way until all of a sudden you have a, um, a supply squeeze about a year, year and a half after the halving um, when you have a parabolic run-up. And the first parabolic run-up in 20, end of 2013, a year and change, year and days after uh, uh, the first halving uh, was 100x. Um, from the having a price and then four years later um, the having of 2016 was about a little over 600 bucks and um, you know kind of went down from there and just wobbled around and then by the end of 2017 you had a parabolic run-up uh, at the end of that year um, to almost 20,000 and so that was 100x then 30x you know what's the next logical sequence um, in, in, in the series, given that uh, the growth has been at about the same pace, ten hmm. x maybe. Yeah, that's a, a lot of stuff to digest over there. So, so we are in the in, in time of space. Uh, we don't have a lot of time right now. So, in terms of uh, what is happening right now in the world, and looking at your fantastic career and uh, multiplicity of different things you've been doing and being involved, and as well being always a, a step or a, actually a lot of steps ahead. How do you see what is happening in the world right now when you touch some parts like, uh, especially in the financial markets and capital markets that we have a massive right now uh, crush to say less. Uh, we have probably the worst meltdown in the last 100 years. So we are in a verge with COVID-19 pandemic and as well all the consequences around that. This is really shifting everything we know about it. And Bitcoin has been kind of surviving, let's be honest. But as well, how do you look at the, the experience and this moment in history? Oh, it's more than survived. It's double the price that it was a year ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's certainly, uh, you, you know, I mean, there's there's no two year period, um, you know, that, that, that you could have uh, lost money unless you just like there was a handful of days you could have bought a little too high and a handful of days you could have sold too low. But, um, you know, the, the you know, we're pretty much on the uh, on the, uh, um, the, the the curve that goes with the stock to flow ratio that. Uh, uh, that was talked about in the, the excellent book that came out in 2018, uh, the Bitcoin Standard, that you know talks about how Bitcoin will become the new gold standard of sound money, and um, because it has all the qualities of gold, if not more, and it's also something that you can move around um, more easily than uh, than gold, and you know you, you can't be frisked for Bitcoin at a border. Um, so uh, um, you know, I think that. Uh, um, we're going to keep continuing along those lines and that uh, um, we're, we're going to, you know, it's, it's still very early. And, and as well in terms of the general industry and, and in terms of the COVID-19, because this is bringing a huge opportunity in terms of digital transformation. Of course, a lot of opportunities will be kind of accelerated on technology yeah. development, special by So a lot of it depends on, on, on what the uh, ultimate response is. If you listen to some people, we're gonna be locked down for two years. And uh, even when places open up, no one's gonna come out. And you know, CDC just 
twice in the last week, uh, even though the current head of the, the CDC, a Trump appointee, has no real background in this, in this area. Um, he was heading up research for a university. Um, but, uh, and I think his, you know, I, I, one of his political reasons was because he was, uh, you know, parading around the country saying that, uh, you can cure AIDS by, uh, just, uh, preaching, um, uh, abstinence. Um, so they have some very odd people running the different parts of government right now. But, um, at any rate, if, if it's true that next winter is going to be worse than this winter and we effectively have a two year lockdown where there's no major events, there's no travel and you have to print money to keep all these industries from going under. I mean, I live here in Puerto Rico. Um, we're very reliant on tourism. Um, I also spend a lot of time and have some investments in, uh, in Las Vegas. And uh, that's a town that's completely reliant on tourism. I mean, if you can't open the casinos, you have, you have 100% unemployment practically. And um, you, know, you just can't print that much money I mean, if you're looking at two years, you're talking about printing fifty trillion dollars, not you know five trillion or six trillion dollars. And at what point does the excess U.S. dollars in the market, um, you know, affect uh, the forex um, and affect the uh, the price of gold? Because the price of gold knows how many how much dollars there are, which is why you can't even buy physical gold. You go to any of the major gold sites now and try to buy physical gold as opposed to the ETFs, which are a promise of future delivery. Um, and, you know, I think people got afraid of the ETF markets uh, when oil went to zero the other day for, for delivery because there was no place that, I mean, we're living in unbelievably strange times. And I think that um, this is the perfect environment for both Bitcoin as a store of value um, and for blockchain as a way to do things like, you know, we haven't even gotten to provenance and supply chain, which are being shown how uh, the current supply chain models um, are still pretty much brick and mortar. I mean, there even the internet really didn't uh, solve a lot of these papers still by um, uh, the port of Los Angeles, which is still closed. Yeah, that's a, uh, uh, there's a lot Black of things. can do it a lot of way. I think we have a delay in your, I think it's good now. So um, probably as a oh. lot, I think you have a, a limited of time. So um, last question. Five more minutes, yes. Okay, so the, the, the principles of, uh, of blockchain is about decentralization. And ultimately, there's two ways of looking at the economy. One is, like you said, print more money and create a kind of a meltdown of, of fake uh, dollar and fake currencies all over the planet, or then create a more sustainable society, which is actually was the, the premises of blockchain technology and the ICOs of creating a more sustainable kind of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, community and, and the society. Do you believe on that? Uh, how do you see that part as being one so, of the- So I, I would say that decentralization is only one of the tenets of what makes a blockchain. Um, tokenization and um, proof, um, you know, that you can't hack an audit trail, which can be done without being decentralized. Just ask IBM or Microsoft who, you know, are using Hyperledger to do that. It is a blockchain, but it's a permission blockchain or a private blockchain. And I think that in general, um, public blockchains are the ones that are going to succeed just as the internet, um, you know, succeeded over intranets, uh, again, going back to the mid nineties, you know, Walmart and GE, they were afraid of the internet. They were like saying, well, I, I, I like the idea of being online, but I don't want to have it be controlled by, you know, people who can hack my system. So we'll go and build our own intranet. And then they realized that, you know, it's not very easy building your own scalable internet and that it was easier building tools that took away your concerns. I mean, Mark Andreessen had an uh, interview many years ago uh, talking about, uh, uh, you know, what problems needed to be solved for the internet to scale and how the same things are going to happen with blockchain. Um, when he first got funded to do Netscape, he all of a sudden, you know, went into the New York Times and said, hey, you should put the New York Times online. And they're like, why would we want to do that? We like selling paper copies. Why would we want to give it away? He went to Macy's and they said, why on earth would we uh, go and get people not in our stores 
Um, and besides, it's not like anybody would ever trust the internet with a, with a uh, credit card. Well, you know, for all these problems, there was a multi-billion dollar company that solved them. You know, can't put a credit card, here's Verisite. Um, don't know anybody on the internet, here's Facebook. Uh, can't find anything on the internet, here's Google. And so uh, Mark Andreessen said he believes that there are opportunities for all of these problems that you see with blockchain right now to be solved by multi-billion dollar companies. And whether those are token companies or whether those are service companies or whether those are exchanges or whether those are development arms or whether those are you know, private companies um, using private blockchains or using you know, stacks on top of a public blockchain. I mean, the biggest uh, uses of the internet right now are all private stacks on top of a public uh, block, uh, on top of a public internet. Amazon, Google, Facebook, they control your data, but they don't control the internet. They basically rely on the internet. If the internet broke, they would break. And um, so I think we're gonna have interesting years ahead to see how that model plays out with um, public, private, and permission blockchains um, going and making more efficient models of initially store value and payments, then chain, uh, you know, um, a supply chain, uh, provenance, and then all the way down the road where if it can be done better, faster, cheaper with a blockchain, someone will put that, bring that to market and the free market will prevail. That's a, a great way to probably conclude. And uh, I don't know if you want just uh, for the audience uh, listening to us, which is becoming a big global audience. Do you want to talk about your present main projects? I know we, you continue very active with Coin Agenda. Um, just yeah. To... So um, I, I'm I'm starting something uh, called a Content Syndicate, um, and it sort of is a I I, I brought uh, Michael Schuler, who was my co-founder at MarketWire. Uh, kind of uh, back uh, into the game, and um, he's now uh, running uh, a couple of uh, news wires that are partnered with um, uh, with Globe, uh, the place that I sold it to, um, uh, in, uh, in in with blockchain uh, news wire for blockchain, and then also uh, NGO wire for um, nonprofits and corporate social responsibility. We've got a legal wire rolling out, a class action lawsuit wire, a medical wire, a small cap wire. And the ultimate vision there um, is to be able to go and have a blockchain component in addition to the, um, you know, the internet distribution, which the company that I built and sold, that doesn't find, I'm not gonna reinvent that. But to be able to prove years later where something still is, because right now you can't do that. And that's the perfect uh, use case for blockchain. So we're working on that. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic. And having you, this is part of the blockchain wire that you've been working on this. So where people- well, Blockchain wire is a, is, a, is a subset of content syndicate that has a much broader vision. Okay. I don't know, well, if you still have time just to explain that, I think would be interesting and as well probably a bit about Coin Agenda, uh, just to wrap up. Sure. Um, Coin Agenda um, has been going on since 2014, um, physically, um, annually in Las Vegas uh, in October, um, typically around the Money 2020 conferences, and um, in the spring in uh, Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, usually in February or, uh, or March. And uh, we've also done events in, uh, in Europe and in Asia. Um, right now with coronavirus shutting things down, we are doing uh, virtual events once a month. They're much shorter, they're about an hour and a half. Um, today that we're filming this, um, I have an event that should still be archived uh, where I'm interviewing uh, Bruce Fenton, um, you know, former executive director of the Bitcoin Foundation and founder of Satoshi Roundtable who uh, has got a lot of press lately for his efforts to open source uh, hacking ventilators so that hospitals can uh, not run out of ventilators when they need them. Um, and then I also have um, uh, one of the top people from the National Science Foundation's uh, rapid grant program. And they also have uh, grants for blockchain companies as well as very fast ones if you have a blockchain or non-blockchain solution that will help the COVID. Um, situation right now in any way, shape, or form. They can get you grants very quickly, like within a couple weeks. Um, 
and then uh, a panel on what the blockchain is doing um, for COVID, um, uh, uh, um, featuring three CEOs who have active initiatives. Uh, Eric Benz, the CEO of Changely, uh, uh, Ben Gertzel, the CEO of uh, Singularity Net, and uh, Pradeep Gold, uh, from, uh, Gold from uh, CEO of um, Solve.Care. And uh, next, mo next month we're gonna do something after the halving about uh, what happened, and I'm gonna bring in some uh, Bitcoin experts as well as some mining experts. Just one last question on the Bit Angels. So, you've been since 2013. What what is Bit Angels doing right now? I think just to get there. Well, right now we're virtual because um, the the 15 chapters that have been doing um, uh, monthly or bi-monthly uh, uh, in-person meetings, um, you know, they're all in the cities that are shut down. So we have a best of cities once a month. Um, the first one is. Um, uh, this Friday, the uh, April 24th, this may be here later than that. And um, then some of the actual cities are going to be doing their own virtual events. And, you know, we're hoping that the cities start opening up enough so that uh, it's not impossible to get uh, 50 people together for a uh, breakfast event uh, with social distancing, um, you know, by the summer in most of these cities. Maybe New York will be the last, but... Uh, you know, in uh, Nevada, we're certainly hoping that, and San Juan, we're certainly hoping that uh, we can return to some kind of uh, uh, normalcy with, uh, you know, obviously uh, uh, safety precautions uh, by the summer. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Michael. I think we are in the last part. Wishing you all the best and as well, uh, uh, keep safe over there and I think we're going to put a, in the interview so this will be three parts there's an interview will be syndicated in different channels and as well we're going to be putting a, a bio profile of yours that will pass for you to make a proper okay. entry on you Fantastic. thank you so much okay, okay. great cheers right. thank All you right. bye bye